412. I'm reading. With the song that sings today, I'm reading, I'm reading, troubles and sorrows have passed away. I'm reading, I'm reading, I love you, my glory, glory, Christ. Welcome to our services today. If you're visiting with us, we invite you to come back anytime you can. We're glad you're here. Please fill out one of those blue cards in the pew and we'll have a record of your attendance. Also, if you're listening by way of radio, we invite you to come be with us here in person. Today in our, in our worship services, directing our singing, Greg Wilhite, First Prayer, Billy Earl Daniels, reading, Michael Phillips, heading the table, John Green. Today, bring our lesson, we have Roy Johnson, <coughs> from Lads to Leaders. Roy is the executive director of the Lads to Leaders. We look forward to hearing from him. Also this afternoon at 2, we have a workshop. We invite you to be there. And our closing prayer, Chaz Shannon. Number 24, number 24, Blessed Assurance.
number 149. 149. Nearer, still nearer. Would you bow with me while I go to God in prayer? 
Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, it is once again we come before you this morning thanking you, first of all, for this little opportunity to spread our last to come out this morning. The similar stiff nature of fashion to sing these songs, hymn and pray in a high and holy name. They hear another portion of our words and to lay it on to meet around our table. We thank you, Father, for the so many wonderful blessings which you've sold upon us, such as food and clothing and shelter. But especially, Father, that we thank you for the spiritual blessing that we have through Jesus Christ, that through obedience to his will, we have hope of eternal salvation. We come pray this morning, Father, for those that are th sick and afflicted, that your congregation, as you put, look down upon them, bless the means of being ministering to them, restore them back to much more health, be thy will. We pray also for those that are uh, mourning because of loss of loved ones, as you look down for them, for thy tender loving hand, and comfort them in this time of sorrow. We ask you, Father, to thank you for the many services that we have done and are doing our mission work, Father. We ask to rich and blessed on them, keep them safe from harm, that I spread that word. We thank you, Father, for the armed forces the world over. We're putting their lives on line, Father, so that we have hope that again, whether we have the opportunity to assemble ourselves in this our manner to worship you and give you the glory which you so richly deserve. As we go through the first text of the service, Father, one Father, we pray that each and every thing we may say and do will be in complete heart with thy will, and to give you the glory which you so richly deserve. For it's in our Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please mark your books at number 218. 218. There's a fountain free. We'll use that as a song of invitation following our lesson today. And our song before the lesson will be 463, Paradise Valley. God's Word. The reading this morning will be taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. Please open your Bibles with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 as we'll be studying there this morning. As you're doing so, again, I'd like to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you today. I'm uh, visiting with you from uh, uh, Hollins, Alabama, near the Talladega National Forest, and uh, which is on fire right now. We're in a drought, and uh, we have a fire going on in that area. And please pray for rain for uh, areas that are needing it uh, very, very badly. But honor and privilege to be with you today. Proverbs chapter 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Key word there is train. 
Now, a proverb is a wise saying, a wise saying, usually true. The wise man Solomon had other wise sayings that are recorded. In particular, I want us to pay attention to some of the things that Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, turn there with us now. As we read just a moment ago, notice in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil or difficult days of not all nigh, when they shall say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble and strong men bow down. And the grinders cease because they are few and those that look through the windows are darkened. And the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low. And he that rises up at the voice of a bird and all the daughters of music are brought low. And, <coughs> pardon me. And when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and uh, they shall fail. And because man goes to his home, and the mourners go about the streets, or the silver core be loosened, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and then shall the dust return to the earth from where it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it vanity. Of vanity, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Let's look at this passage and think about it just a moment. It begins now, by remember now thy creator in days thy youth before the evil or difficult days coming. And he talks about how that things happen to all of us as we age. And these things are difficult. These things are problematic. And he mentions there is no pleasure in them, he says. He talks about things such as your grinders becoming few, and that's your teeth. Your grinders becoming few. Ever had a toothache? Any pleasure in a toothache? And he says there's no pleasure in them. <coughs> Pardon me. My little granddaughter was sitting in my lap the other day and looked in my mouth and pointed to some dental work. And she said, what is this? What is this? I said, well, that's, some, uh, that's a crown. You see, that's what happens to all of us as we age. We start having to have dental work done. He mentions in this passage the almond tree blooming. Almond tree is your hair turning white. And many of us would have more white hair if we didn't get a little help from other things. Those of us who happen to have a little hair left, and I do not have much myself, okay. But he mentions the almond tree blooming as we age. He mentions your backs bending. Now we recognize that we lose calcium as we age and we actually bend over a little bit and lose some height in our old age and that's what the wise man Psalm was talking about, back issues there. He mentions in verse 5, fear of heights. He said they shall have fear of heights. I had, uh, we had Brother James Watkins two years ago do a gospel meeting at my home congregation. Brother Watkins was 87 years old making his way to stage and great blessing to have that uh, preacher of God's word with us but as he was coming he was holding on to a rail because he could not afford to have a broke hip and I'm sure he no longer cleans out his gutters I'm sure that he no longer climbs an apple tree to get an apple because he understands the danger that comes from falling especially as you become older fear of heights is mentioned there in verse 5 he also mentions other things that affect us as age. He mentions your eyesight, your eyesight. I'm wearing eyeglasses, and, I, and these are bifocals. It may be possible that the doctor may be telling you that you have cataracts and need to have it removed. Or the doctor may be telling you that you need, do not need to drive at night any longer. And you hear that sometimes because we have issues with our eyesight as we age. Another passage there that I love is, he mentions the keepers of the house shall tremble. Keepers of the house are your hands. These strong hands that used to grab that pickle jar and open that pickle jar, these hands, because of age and miles and time, these hands start shaking and trembling. 
I was with a dear friend the other day, an elder at a congregation near Birmingham, who was trying to sign his name. And as he was doing so, his hand was shaking so much he could hardly sign his name. And my heart went out to him. I was touched. And I know it was embarrassing him a little bit, but the issue is all the miles and the hard work and the hard work. And now his hand is shaking and his hand is trembling. And the wise man Solomon said, there is no pleasure in this. There's no fun in this. He calls it evil or difficult days as we age. <coughs> so what does he say? Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Before these evil or difficult days come, before your back starts hurting, while you can still see, while you still can eat anything what you want to eat, while you're still a strong and while you still have good health, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth because as we age, our bodies are going to fall apart and there is no fun, it is no pleasure when that happens to us. Picture something, if you would, in your mind's eye. Picture this little baby that is born to a Christian family and he's brought to church for the first time. This little baby boy is wrapped in a blue blanket and we all go up to this baby boy and we do baby talk. I'm not sure why, but we do gag gag goo goo, you know, to the baby. We do baby talk to the baby. And he's brought to church and he's in Bible school class and he grows up in vacation Bible school and here at church and somewhere around age 12. This young boy walks up the aisle and takes the preacher's hand and says he wants to become a New Testament Christian. He says he realizes the difference between right and wrong. And he knows what sin is and feels like he has sinned and he has committed sins and he wants forgiveness of those sins and the preacher studies the Bible with him and he understands, uh, he understands the difference between right and wrong and he stands before this audience and confesses his faith in Jesus Christ and he says he wants to repent of those sins and the preacher takes him to the baptistry, and there he's buried with the Lord in baptism. He's immersed in water where he contacts the blood of Jesus Christ, as Romans chapter 6 teaches us. He is born again, as Jesus was to explain to Nicodemus, who say, he told Nicodemus, you must be born of the water and the Spirit. And he's buried with his Lord in baptism, and the Lord adds him to the church. The Lord adds daily to the church those that should be saved. And now, this young man, we welcome him to God's family. We hug him and we welcome him to God's family. He's part of the church and he's bringing his Bible to church with him every Sunday. He's all excited and he grows and before long, he's waiting on the Lord's table one Sunday morning serving the church. He's leading closing prayer one Sunday night. But something strange happens around, around age 15. And I'm not really sure what it is, but something strange happens. Because now when the Lord's Supper is going on, now when his mind needs to go to Calvary, now we need to be thinking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he is sitting there writing notes with his friends and they are texting each other. But then comes age 16. Do you know what age 16 means? Car keys. Car keys. And do you know where you can go if you just have enough gasoline? Did you know about the boat show they're having? Did you know about the gun show they're having? Do you know about the sale they're having at Sears? Do you know about all the... Do you know how many cousins you have and how many uncles and how many relatives you have? Do you know you need to go to Atlanta? You need to go to Nashville? Do you know you need to go here? You need to go there? Do you, you need to go everywhere except church on Sunday. And this has really bothered mother and daddy. And they're hoping that he would like to get a Christian education, but he's not interested in that. Instead, he falls in love with a local girl who has no religion at all. And before long, we're having a wedding service here in the church building. And you have the preacher standing here, and you've got him wearing his nice outfit. And she's in her beautiful white wedding gown. And the preacher keeps asking questions, and they say, I do or I will. And... And then you may kiss the bride, and they go out the door, and we throw rice or bird seed, what else politically correct. And, the, and in this new home, this new home, the Word of God is not found. Oh, yes, they have a Bible. They have uh, several Bibles. 
Bible. They have on the coffee table. They have on the bookshelf. But in this new home, Bible study is not in their home. Sunday morning does not mean worshiping God. Sunday morning means sleeping in so you can get ready to go to work Monday. Or it means going to the mall or going to a movie, anything, but it's not worshiping God. Now, in this new home, guess what? A little baby's born. A little baby's born. But this little baby gets to come to church. Once a year on Mother's Day, they bring the grandbaby to church so he can sit with Grandma and Grandpa in church on Mother's Day. And the little baby gets his one day of church a year. And that's what the grandchild is getting. Folks, I'm not talking about anybody from Hollins, Alabama. I'm not talking about anybody here in your community. But you know people who went through our Bible school programs. You know people that used to sit in the church building. You remember them. And you know that many of them are not worshiping God anywhere today. That's a reality. Many are not worshiping God anywhere today. We do a very poor job when it comes to keeping our own. A very poor job. I have three indicators that tell us we do a poor, poor job. One is statistics. I mentioned some in Bible class this morning. On average, we're keeping about 38% of those that just attend church with mother and daddy, uh, faithful to the Lord's church 10 years after high school graduation. I didn't tell you that, that number drops to 15% if they only come with one parent. I'm not sure what it is, but if they only come with one parent, it appears they take after the parent they're not attending church with much more than they do the one they are attending church. With 15%, that, is, that should scare us to death. And yes, there are many things that you can do to improve that, many things such as a Christian education, many things such as a good involvement here in the local church with many things that you have going on. But even then, that ought to scare us to death. And one of the reasons is the birth rate, the birth rate. The last time I saw the numbers, I saw a Wall Street Journal that somebody slid on my door when I was at a hotel a couple years ago. And it mentioned the national birth rate at that time had dropped to 1.87, 1.87. Now, I'm from Alabama, so it's hard for me to understand this. But what that means is this. Two people, two people, husband and wife, no longer have two children, boy and girl or whatever, two children. Instead, now they have 1.87. That is the lowest birth rate. And by the way, that's a citizen's. Key word is citizen there. Key word citizen. That's the lowest birth, recorded birth rate in the history of the United States. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? It means, let's look back and notice that uh, I'm looking in particular, I'm thinking about Brother Conley, he's one of the preachers at University Church in Montgomery, Alabama. Brother Conley is up in years, and he is one of 26 children. He has 25 brothers and sisters. Imagine that. And my dad was one of the seven. Seven children. My dad was one of seven. By the way, they all lived into their 90s. They were one of seven. And I'm one of three. And I have three sons, and all my three sons, my three sons are married. So I have three sons and three daughters-in-law. That equals six. And I have four grandchildren. Do you see what I'm just telling you? I have four grandchildren. Six equals four, 1.75. Do you see the point I'm making? You see, in the times when, when you had 26 brothers and sisters or 26 children and half of them were faithful to the Lord's church you still had two whole pews sitting with you on Sunday morning now when you have seven children you keep in about half of them you have two or three sitting with you on Sunday morning when you have 1.87 and you're keeping half or less of those you close 84 churches of Christ a year since the year 2006 you have a loss of 8,250 church members every single year since 2006. The Church of Christ membership peaked in 2006, estimated number at one and a quarter million here in the United States. And by the way, God only knows the numbers. I mean, they're figuring with Lord as the church daily, those that should be saved, and God only knows. But that being said, 
Do you see what's going on in the trend there? I'm so glad to see your mission work you're doing here and all the things you're doing here at this church. I've noticed in particular your mission work in India. And you're probably aware that the number of Christians in India now is over one million. There's over one million Christians in India. And probably by the end of this year, there'll be new, more Christians in India than in the United States, probably by the end of this year. And Africa has a million Christians in Africa also. But what is my point here? How does this relate? The birth rate is so important, and it relates to church growth also. So statistics tell us we're doing a bad job. Also, personal observation. I'm blessed with going and traveling and visiting many places. Glad to be with you here today. Wednesday night, I spoke at the uh, Castle Rock Church in Denver, outside of Denver, Colorado. And so I'm somewhere all the time. That being said, I see many congregations that say, we no longer need Bible classes. We no longer need these Sunday school rooms because we don't have a youth left. Many of them say, bring your old TV sets or your old couches you have, and you can put them in these classrooms because we've got to put something in them. We don't have any children, so we might as well put something in them. Folks, that is the reality when you're visiting and when you're traveling. Also, personal testimony. Personal testimony. Just a matter of fact, two weeks ago, I talked about some of these same things, and afterwards a lady came up to me after worship and said, you're wrong about your numbers. You're talking about the number that we're losing, and you're wrong about your numbers. And that being said, they said, uh, I said, well, yes, yeah, possible. I, I mean, may be wrong. There may be some error there. And she said, no, no, you said one out of three. She said, I have three teenage sons, and I cannot get a one of them to go to church with me anymore. I have three, and they will not go any longer. There's a book out called Already Gone. Ken Ham is one of the three authors of that book. And it deals with a study of losing our youth. And it's not just tied to the Lord's church. It involves what they call the evangelical, evangelical movement, a larger group than just us. That being said, that being said, he points out some interesting things there. He said, uh, back to church attendance, most attend church in their elementary eight years. Most attend church in their junior high years. Most attend church in their high school years. But then in college, the number drops to 11% of those attending church in college. And somebody says, well, I know what it is. It's college that did it or going to work that did it. And that may have some effect on it. But he started asking other questions. He said, when did you stop believing in God? When did you stop believing that his word has got to be followed, that his word is inspired and is absolute and there's no question about God's word? And this is what all scares scare us to death. And that is 40% said they stopped believing the word of God when they were in their elementary classes at church or their junior high classes. That's almost one out of two. 40% said while they were in the elementary classes is when they stopped believing that this was God's word. And another 40.7% said when they were in the high school classes here at church. So what does that mean? That means by the time they graduated from high school, over 80% of those who were sitting in Bible school class said they really didn't think that this book had to be followed, that it wasn't, wasn't uh, something you had to follow. It was optional. The thought, title of that book was already gone. Do you see the point is this? You think they leave the church when they go off to college. You think they leave the church when they get a job. That's because they're out of the house and they're not riding with you to church any longer. They've got their own house. They've got their own place to leave. But they were already gone many years before, and we didn't realize it. They were gone many years before while they were sitting here, and we didn't get it. That's why we have to pay attention to this so much more. There are many things that affect us on trying to build our Christian families. Two of them I'll mention. One happens to be instruction, and one happens to be inconsistencies. Instruction. I want to compliment you on your fine education system you have here at church. It's obvious with your classes. It's obvious with your billboards. It's obvious with your, your emphasis on teaching. And, and that this is awesome. It's a great congregation you have here. But this is not true in many places. Visiting a church just recently where they said it doesn't matter who teaches the little ones. I said, what? 
They said, oh, no, it doesn't matter who teaches the little ones. Just go get somebody out of the auditorium. Give them some crayons, give them a puzzle, and tell them to keep them quiet. That's all that matters. Now, just keep them quiet because we won't keep them quiet so they don't bother us in the adult class. But I'll tell you what, in that adult class, we want somebody that knows Greek and Hebrew, and they better have a Ph.D. in that adult class because we're afraid those folks in the adult class, they're going to start doing drugs in that adult class, and they're, they're starting shacking up together in that adult class. And we worry about those adults, but it doesn't matter who teaches the kids. Just get somebody out there and let them teach the kids. But that adult class is where we... Folks, do we have the world upside down? We have the emphasis on the wrong end. And when we put the emphasis on the wrong end, it comes back and bites us. And that's why it's so important that we put the emphasis on those who are young. Inconsistencies. Inconsistencies. Inconsistency would be if I preach one way and live differently. Inconsistency would be as you as a parent, when you tell your boys and girls to read their Bibles, but you are not reading yours. Inconsistency is say, make sure you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts and Letter Rome. Make sure you know the books of the Bible, but, but you do not know the books of the Bible. Inconsistency is when we're telling them to do things that we're not doing. Somebody said a teenager can spot a hypocrite a mile away. Now, that's exaggeration. Great exaggeration. But they're not really paying a whole lot of attention to what we say coming out of our mouth. They're watching to see exactly that which we do. And that which we do speaks so much louder than anything we say. They're watching that which we do. Inconsistencies. Let me touch on three areas that we're inconsistent in. Now, there are many areas we're inconsistent, but we could be here all day talking about areas that we're inconsistent in. But time's sake, we'll touch on three areas we're inconsistent. One is we're inconsistent when it comes to worshiping God. How wonderful it is to come together and to break bread on the first day of the week and to worship God with his family, with the saints. Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the assembly of saints like as a custom of some is. In John 4, 24, God's a spirit. We worship him in spirit and truth. It's so wonderful to, to sing together these great songs, to, to worship together, to pray together, to, to encourage each other, to fellowship together. It's so wonderful to be here. Little Johnny, little Johnny said, Daddy, if it was so wonderful, why are we not coming back tonight? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Coming, coming out of the mouth, the little one. He said, if it's so wonderful, Daddy, why don't we come more? If it's so wonderful. Our inconsistencies. I grew up in central Alabama and still live there. And folks, it does not snow much in central Alabama. You get some, more, a lot more than we do. I lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, director of the Boy Scouts in northeast uh, Pennsylvania, uh, northwest Pennsylvania for several years. And when I moved up there, I found out that snow came in inches. I didn't know that. I thought it was just a few flakes. Okay. Then I found out snow came in feet, and I certainly didn't know that. My neighbors told me to shovel the driveway. I said it will melt. It did in April. Okay, so it was a, uh, it was a different world for me to live in. But that being said, I grew up in central Alabama, and growing up in central Alabama as a little bit kid, I remember my dad coming to me one Sunday morning and said, Dad, hey, my dad said, put on your church clothes. Put on your church clothes. Now I said, Daddy, it snowed last night. He said, where? I said, look out the window, right there on that bush. There's some snow on that bush right there. It snowed last night. He said, put on your church clothes, go to church. I said, Dad, the weatherman. The weatherman said we'd be sliding around all over the place, killing a lot of people on the way to church. And the weatherman advises us to all watch cartoons today. That's what the weatherman said. It'd be best if we all just watch cartoons today. He said, hush and put on your coat. We're going to church. You know what that is? You call that a memory. A memory. You see, when it's a beautiful day, and it's not too hot, and it's not too cold, and everything wonderful, we're attending church. It's glad, I'm glad you're here, but it's not really a memory. i tell you what a memory is. is ladies, when it's raining so hard, that it doesn't matter what your hair do used to be. Your hair is all stuck to your head. And the little kids are looking at you and laughing at you. Those, those, you know, those are memories, okay? Memories are when the power goes out and we have to sing songs by heart because we can't see here in the building. Those are memories. 
Remember, it was our Wednesday night when it came a hailstorm in my home congregation and knocked out the windshield of my Honda Accord. And we know who was at church on Wednesday night because all of our automobiles are beat up. If your automobile's not beat up, you were not there on Wednesday. All those are members. What kind of members are you making? What kind of members are you making? Somebody says, I sure am glad you're talking to those parents and you're grinning because you don't have any children that are here or they're all grown or moved away. And you say, that's right. Talk to those parents now. Let me talk to you. You see, in the Lord's Church, we have a signed seating. I'm not sure if you know that or not, but we have a signed seating in the Lord's Church. That's why when I came in this morning, I came up and sat right on the front pew. When you're traveling, it's always safest just to come on up and sit on the front pew. Nobody will mess with you if you do that. If you sit anywhere else, you're in danger of sitting in someone's seat. Now, I was in Houston, Texas. When I tell you the congregation's name, you may have some relatives there. I was in Houston, Texas, and uh, my wife was with me. She didn't like coming up front, so we sat about halfway back. And after Bible study, I'm out meeting people and greeting people, and she's sitting in the pew, and a gentleman comes up and just stares and stares and stares at her. And finally, the gentleman says, This is my family's pew. Would you mind moving? And I told the church leadership afterward, I said, it's nice you have visitor parking out front. Well, you come in the building, they tell us to leave because we don't know where to sit. You need visitor seating also so we know where to sit down. What's my point? Every boy and girl here knows where your seat is. And they've heard the sick list, and they know if you're sick. They know what, and they're looking to see if you're here. And if you're not here, why should they be here? Inconsistent, click quickly on uh, on, on forgiving others. We want the little boys and girls to forgive others. James 5, 16, confess your faults one to another. We want the little boys and girls to hug and make things right, but we big people hold grudges. You got a man on one side of the building that's mad at the man on the other side of the building. He doesn't know why, but this man's grandpappy told him that that man's grandpappy did something to them. So all during church, you keep an eye on that person. You'll keep your eye on him. They'll watch him all during church. There's no telling them what that guy's going to do. And the woman over here says, that woman over there shouldn't wear that color dress. Everybody knows that color dress look, looks bad on her. And the preacher from Alabama couldn't understand the thing he said. And the song, we had too many songs. It was too hot in the building. It was too cold in the building. We get in the car and we say that all the way home. You have just asked your boys and girls to leave the church. You told them you didn't like the preacher. You told them you didn't like half the people went there. You told them, and they listened. So they left. Be real careful when you're slapping the church around. It's the bride of Jesus Christ. But not only that, you're inviting your children to leave the church when you're slapping the church around. And last, we're inconsistent when it comes to praying. To praying. You have not because you ask not. James said, if any man lacks wisdom, let us ask of God that give us liberally to all men and pray us not. Anybody need wisdom? I know I do. We have not because we ask not. What did Jesus do before he went to the cross? He prayed a prayer that I do not think we can comprehend, mentioned in the Gospels, including Luke chapter 22. He's pouring out his heart to God as he's seeing the cross coming. And he sees the pain. Father, if there be any way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but thy will be done. Thy will be done. We need to be praying for the prodigal sons and daughters who wandered away. We need to be praying for elders and deacons and preachers. We need to be praying for our Bible school teachers. We need to be praying for our moms and dads grandparents we need to be praying a lot more than we've been praying we're inconsistent when it comes to praying so let's put a ribbon around our lesson and call it finished that being the case somebody said well I'm just a good old average Christian family I got some advice for you if you're an average Christian family, you better be, get busy trying to have some more kids because otherwise you're going to be sitting beside yourself all by yourself. All by yourself. Because average is less than high. And that's not good enough. That's why we've got to be better examples. Realizing there are other people looking at us. We've got to realize the influence we have on others. And we have to make some memories. My dad made a memory he didn't realize he made. 
in August in Alabama during a gospel meeting when I was a little boy back in the 60s. Gospel meeting when people responded to the invitation, when people came up. He was one of those that answered the invitation. He was already a Christian. Matter of fact, he was already, already an elder in the Lord's church. But he stood before the congregation and asked for prayers to the church that he might do a better job because he said he was uneducated and was trying to do the best he could, but he wanted the prayers of the church because he just didn't, didn't know enough. And I'm a little boy sitting in the back. And I'll take that memory to my grave. My dad died in 93. But I remember that. What kind of memories are they going to have of you? We're going to offer an invitation. I encourage you, if you're not a New Testament Christian, become one the same way we talked about already. By acting upon your belief in Jesus Christ, being willing to confess it before me and repent, turn around, live differently, change the way you're living. And what do you do with the old person that's dead to sin? You bury the old person that's dead to sin in baptism to rise to walk in you. And for those of us who are Christians, We've got to be faithful. We've got to realize people are watching us. If you're subject anyway, will you come as we stand and sing?